It frustrates me we're putting all of this time and effort, energy and blood, sweat and tears into these sales cycles. And I know I carried a quota for 15 years. I know how much stress and effort and internal scrutiny is put on salespeople. We can't be allowing these deals to not only be lost, but for us to extract no value from it and then go ahead and make the same mistake again. Hey y'all, welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr., You're now listening to Selling with Social. Kian McLaughlin, I am pumped, my friend, that you're joining me here today on Selling with Social. Thank you so much. All the way from the down under out in Australia, Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, yeah, great to be here, Mario. And uh, for those of you that don't know Kian, he's a good friend of mine, a uh, sales thought leader, also a best-selling author of the title of the book, Rebirth of a Salesman, Is that, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? As luck would have it, I have a copy here. That's it, Rebirth of a Salesman. I love it. So uh, do me a favor, Kian. Uh, not everybody here uh, knows who you are. So we've got sales, we've got sales leaders, we've got marketing leaders, sales enablement operations. Give us a little background about yourself. I know you're the CEO of Trinity Perspectives, but tell us what you do and, and how you help salespeople. So yes, as you say, I'm the founder and CEO of Trinity. Um, we're a sales training and enablement company, but we do something which is maybe a little bit unique. We help B2B organizations better understand why they win and why they lose the big deals they pitch for. And we do that in a remarkably simple way. We go and have a chat to their customers and we say, hey, can you help us understand what happened? Uh, so we get right to the source interview usually three or four of the key stakeholders on the customer side, people who are actually involved in making the decision. And then we take those learnings and we feed them back in, reverse engineer them and use that as a mechanism to sweat the asset of our cost of sale as a vendor and actually get some value from it. So so that's a part of the business. And then, as you said, I'm an author. I'm also a sales blogger. And my blog has been picked as one of the top 50 in the world for the last couple of years. I do a lot of keynote speaking around the world. And you know, I think if I sum it up, I'm just, I carried a sales bag for probably 15 years in, in the tech sector. So I'm a huge, huge advocate of sales professionals. I know it can be a tough gig, but I know it can be an incredibly rewarding gig. And as you know, if no one sells anything, then nothing happens and the wheels grind to a halt and none of us want that to happen. So anything that I can do to kind of elevate the conversation, I'm very, very happy to um, provide some nuggets. Awesome. Well, your model is quite interesting and it makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. Go into organizations, customer base or lost customer base or lost prospects and interview them on why they left and or why they purchased and then take those insights and turn around and help a company to be able to improve their salesmanship or womanship, <laughs> used in a general sense, of course, to be able to help them advance their skill set, be better sellers, and or create better value for their clients and the relationships. So this is interesting to me because, first off, brilliant idea in terms of how you engage and how you help organizations. But clearly, you've interviewed hundreds of B two B buyers over the past, I think it's been seven years. Seven since years, that's right. Yeah, yeah, seven years. And so you've obviously influenced them about what influenced their buying decision. So tell me a little bit about what influences a buyer's buying decision. You know, I've had a lot of surprises over that period of time talking to all of these um, decision makers. And I think the first big surprise for me was just how willing to share most customers are. So if you create the right context and you explain we want to find this out because we want to extract some value from our cost of sale. We want to find this out because we want to get better. We want to find this out because we want to better train and enable our people. We want to find this out because hopefully, even if we've lost, there might be an opportunity for us to work with you in the future. Customers are incredibly responsive to this because, you know, at the end of the day, customers are just people. And so that's a normal, natural, professional, appropriate thing to ask, particularly if you know when to ask. So don't ask, immediately after the sale is you know closed and you've lost it you should be actually asking earlier on in the piece because if you do that you know it lets them know you don't have an agenda and more importantly it says as an organization 
we take this seriously and we take feedback from our customers seriously because we recognize that's probably the single best mechanism for us to improve. So if you context it that way, most customers are, are very, very open to sharing. They won't tell you everything necessarily. They might not talk about your competitors. They might not talk about you know pricing discrepancies, but a lot of the time they will. A lot of the time it's almost like they've been waiting to, uh, to be asked and it's like a truth serum has been injected into their arm and you can't shut them up and it's extraordinary, particularly as a third party because despite the fact that we're being paid by the vendor to go in there, we have a little bit of independence. We've created an environment where they can feel open and, and transparent. And in terms of what they say, you know, we work in, in the B2B world towards the sort of the top end. So, you know, deal values that might be, you know, above 50 or 100K, right the way up to hundreds of millions of dollars. So you would have thought there'd be a huge discrepancy in terms of the feedback you get from the bottom end of that spectrum to the top end. But so much of what we hear is relatively consistent. And if I was to sum it up in a kind of a, you know, a bite-sized chunk, I would say that your product and your price are very, very important, but they're a box tick, right? So product gets you to the start line. Price, you know, usually gets you to the start line, unless you haven't found a different mechanism to differentiate. Now, we will often get to a position where, you know, a customer uses a term like apples for apples. So, you know, we had three vendors. As far as we were concerned, it was apples for apples. Product-wise, they could all do it. We didn't see much differentiation, so we ended up going for the one that was the most cost-effective for us. So if you're in a situation where you haven't found a mechanism to differentiate, there's a good chance that price is going to be a key factor. But if you have found a mechanism to differentiate in some meaningful way, and by meaningful way, I mean meaningful in the eyes of the customer because value is in the eye of the beholder. And the mistake we make a lot of in the industry is we throw a lot of features and functions against the wall and we hope something will stick. But the organizations that have really honed their pitch by listening to their customers and then playing back to them um, what they've heard in the context of their product or their solution or their industry, they're the ones that actually can create a, a inverted commas value proposition. And they're the ones that start to differentiate. But if you put product and price on this side, the real differentiator is people and purpose. That's what keeps coming up time and time and time again. Now, there's a lot of components to people and purpose, but what we hear is we hear, look, we liked you. You got us. There was strong cultural fit. You had a lot of credibility. References are becoming less and less and less relevant in the industry now. So you know that way we pitch up and we, you know, we put up our slide deck. Here's all the companies we've worked with yeah. in recent years. Stop doing that. Stop doing that today. And I'll tell you why. Because what happens is the people on the other side of the table, the prospect, all they do is they start taking notes. They go, oh, yeah, I know someone who works there. I know someone who works there. And then you have reference calls happening straight away that you haven't prepared anyone for. And we've heard from many, many customers now. They said, look, to be honest, we saw a couple of their customers. We reached out to people we knew there, and they said, we don't know them. That's not a great product. We've had some issues. And that was the deal dead in the water. So my advice is, if you're going to talk about existing customers, and you know, often we need to do that from a credibility perspective, change that slide every single time. Put in maybe three, maybe four, and make sure there, there's a specific reason you have those ones, and then give the context to the customer. So I've put up m and holdings because they have a similar problem to the one we're talking to you about. And maybe in the future, that would be a good point of reference. I've put up these guys because even though they're not in your industry, they're in an adjacent industry and there's good complement or overlap between the two. That's the other issue. We're giving information constantly in isolation and we're not actually answering the so what question. So it's this kind of show up and throw up mentality. Here you go, here you go, here's lots of content versus here's a piece of information in the context as to why you should care about this. Ah, okay, as a customer, now I get that, and now we can move on. So people, the quality of your people, they're making decisions. Your people are the personification of your brand. They are actually buying your people most of the time. And by the way, they get a bit of tech as well. So that's something that really surprised me. And the other thing that kind of blew me away, I have to admit, is how much um, value customers put on the purpose of the vendor they're working with. So what's your overarching purpose? What are you here for? You know, apart from making some money and maximizing shareholder value, what do you genuinely care about? That comes up time and time again. And where we see an alignment between the purpose of the customer and the purpose of the vendor, something above just, you know, we're going to deliver a solution that works, that gives customers something to hold on to. And it also is a huge point of differentiation if you've got a couple of players who are otherwise reasonably close to one another. So yeah, just a couple of things off the top of my head. That's an interesting point that you bring up about the uh, whole references idea. You know, I have a personal philosophy and that is, it's nice to throw out big company names and uh, to, you know, folks we've worked with here, there, and the other. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, what I found in my selling career 
is you've got to know your audience, right? If you tell a, in our case, we work with uh, sales teams that are, you know, 25 salesperson sales teams, and we work with companies that have a 10,000 salespeople, right? Yep. So if you tell the 25 person sales company, oh yeah, we've worked with, you know, these big, large companies, and they might think you're too big to be able to work more intimately with their 25 salespeople. Absolutely right. And so you really have to make sure that you understand before you throw out a name or a reference, you want to understand specifically. And one of the things that I've always gone back to is, is if you look at now, what we're looking for is the net result. The net result is, is how many more conversations can we help Vangresso help a customer have? That's how you measure us. So instead of throwing out customer references and putting up logos, I'm all about record a video with the sales rep. Let the sales rep tell the experience of how they actually went around, went about getting an appointment as an example, or how many more appointments they got. And so um, I really never thought of the science behind what you just went through. Mm -hmm. It's more been innate in terms of something that I've always done. But it's interesting how, of course, we throw out a customer name and a client's and I'm like, I know, make a mental note. I know somebody over there. I'm going to go pick up the phone and call them and figure out. As we all know now, we're, we're so connected. You know, everyone's only kind of, two steps removed from anyone else, certainly in, in, in the industry we work in. So we've had so many deals where the customer said to us, to be honest, they were dead in the water at that point. I called up Frank. I said, Frank, what do you think of these guys? He said, I don't know who they are. And I said, well, hey, they had you on a slide. And he's like, well, look, we might use them somewhere in the organization somewhere, but if they were strategic, I would know about it because I'm the CIO. And that's it. You're, it's game over straight away. So, you know, that's just one small point. But I think the real thing is, there aren't enough for most organizations, most vendors out there. We haven't got a million opportunities that we can go after all the time. So what we need to do is actually take a little bit more time, tailor our presentations, tailor our, our proposals, tailor our conversations. It needs to be a little bit personalized. It needs to be relevant. It needs to be bespoke because that changes the dynamics. Once I know that what you're, you're sending me is not something that you've done a search and replace on someone else's name and put my name in, but you've actually thought about me, you, you have some credibility and context in my industry, then you've earned the right to the next conversation. And I think to your point about more conversations and more conversations, I have a really simple philosophy in relation to B2B sales. We don't need to sell anything. All we need to do is earn the right to move to the next step, move to the next conversation. So that takes the pressure off us not to have to go, right, I've got to sell something. I've just got to nail this interaction, this conversation, this meeting, this proposal. And then from the customer's perspective, if they see value, we'll move forward. I mean, that might be a little bit simplistic, but it's not overly simplistic because it actually takes the pressure off the customer as well. You know that way, Mary, if you, you walk into a store and someone says, hey, can I, can I help you? And you're like, no, 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 I'm just browsing. Yeah, but we will want to be helped at some point, but just give us some time to browse. Customers are in the same position; they don't want that pressure to progress. And if you know, if we have our sales process and they have their buying process, we're putting way too much focus on our sales process and not nearly enough understanding where are they at. I did some work with a company, and they had a new sales guy who just joined recently, and he'd come from the customer side, so he'd never done sales before, and he was just kind of freaking out about you know, oh, it's, you know, it's, I'm going to be a sales guy and I don't know how to do it, and I was like. To be honest, it's not as hard as you think. Not you've that got, hard. Not that hard. You've come from the customer side. You've got tons and tons of credibility. So we did this Absolutely. little exercise. So I said, look, here's the sales process. We documented it on one page. And he said, all right, well, here's our buying process that I went through. So he documented that. And then he did something which was really, really smart. Now when he goes out and he meets a prospect, he sits down with him and says, hey, have a look at this. This is kind of the process we go through most of the time when we sell our, our kit, our technology to people. And this is often the buying process we see on the other side. Just have a look at that buying process and tell me, does that line up with how you guys do things internally here? And they might say, well, no, we don't. We, we need a steering committee meeting or we do this or this is how we get bought. And he's like, okay. And he said, what about this sales process that I have? Does that line up with how you want to kind of move forward? And they might redline that a little bit. And now they've got a shared language for all their conversations moving forward. And what it hasn't done is one of every single piece of business, but what it has done is completely stop deals going quiet. Because one of the main reasons that deals go quiet is customers feel they're being pressured or they feel they're being pulled or pushed in a particular direction. So he's been able to just get rid of that by actually just saying, you know what, here's what we're doing, here's what you're doing. We both know. So if I'm asking you to do this, but you're not quite there yet, just tell me because now we know how our processes work. Really, really simple. Most of this stuff is simple. And most of it is also not thinking that our customer is some, you know, alien race. It's just another human. And let's actually, you know, be kind of appropriate in how we engage with them. Yeah, well, that goes back to your value in uh, the purpose of the vendor 
versus the purpose of the customer, right? So making sure that those two elements are aligned. Like, uh, so the process, yes, but before you even get to that process, what is your goal here in terms of what you're trying to accomplish? And a great example of that is today I joined a, a call with our director of sales it was a sales enablement team that reached out to us that wanted to inquire more. And, you know, they opened up the conversation. I, you know, I opened it up with, what are your objectives you want to get out of today's conversation? Sure. Um, and uh, they opened up with, well, you know, we're, we're actually exploring. We really know that we need to do something. There's this thing called the internet. And I don't know, we need to start digitally prospecting and we need to start casting our nets wider. And all of our VPs are saying we need to do something bigger, but we're not really sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, so they said, so we know we need to have better consistency in our brand and we need to start engaging. And I'm like, but what do you want to accomplish? Well, what we want to accomplish is to be able to cast the net wider um, so that our reps can start, you know, having better connections. Well, what does that want to accomplish? Help me understand. Uh, that's what I kept asking. But why? Yeah. But why? But why? And ultimately where it leads to is typically there are generally two problems that, you know, VPs of sales, at least who we sell to are trying to solve. Number one, more conversations with more qualified buyers. That's number one. And number two, better close ratio. <laughs> and those are the generally the two problems that we're trying Absolutely. to solve. Absolutely. If you can align those two purposes together, whether it's a VP of sales or a VP of IT, it doesn't really matter. If you can align the purpose and understand that why behind there, then that can really go well with, does it even match your global view? Because if you're coming to me as an example with Vingresso mm -hmm. and you're saying, I must increase the closing skills, but I need to digitally prospect. Well, wait a minute. Increasing the closing skills is because you have enough in your pipeline already. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is improve the performance of the close. That's not us. That's a different sales training company, right? Two different purposes. And I think those are the things that need to be aligned um, inside of the sales process. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you mentioned something about early on, but what you guys do for companies is yeah. um, helping them to do the analysis of the win or the loss. But I'm going to go off on a whim here. And I'm going to pick a number out. I'm pretty positive putting on my XVP of sales hat on that we probably analyzed less than 10% of our win losses. Yep. We had a win, we had a loss, we wrote up the win. Generally sales reps write up the win. Well, why did the customer choose? Because I had a relationship and that's what usually got submitted. Why did we lose? Price. <laughs> and then you're trying to, you know, sales operations or enablements calling up the sales rep saying, but why, but why? And they're not getting very much, right? So usually there wasn't a deep dive into analysis and I don't know if the number is 10%, you tell me, but why don't more B2B companies actually take the time to analyze the win-loss? So do you want to know the real answer? Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you have a number? What is the number? I'll give you the number, but then I'll give you the reason. So the number is, is less than 10%. And those that Hallelujah. do- Hallelujah. I was right. That, those that do only focus, most of them only focus on their losses. They don't focus on their wins. And those that even do it, do it in a, you know, in a somewhat haphazard manner. So they may have a conversation with the customer, but Mary, if, if I was a sales rep and you were the customer and I just lost a piece of business and then I came to you and I said, Hey Mario, I'm really, really disappointed that, you know, we've just lost that business. Can you tell me why? And if some of the reasons were, well, Ken, you didn't do a crash hot job. Your, your tender response was very poor. Your proposal was all over the place. And by the way, when your boss came in, he was a bit of an idiot and, you know, et cetera. That's very, that puts you in a very awkward position to give me that feedback. And then even yeah. if you give me that feedback, what am I supposed to do with that? I report back to my boss. I tell him he's an idiot. I re report back that I did a terrible job or, or I throw one of my colleagues under the bus because they, you know, dropped the ball or whatever. It's just... If you think about it, and I put it in the sporting context, a sporting analogy where great sports teams, you know, watch the game tape back and then they, they take action off the back of that. If the intent behind doing a win review and a loss review is genuinely to say, I just want to know, just help me understand so I can get better, so I can improve. If that's the real intent with no other subtext or no other agenda, then you need to create a mechanism that makes the customer feel totally comfortable. You need to create a mechanism where it's repeatable so we can start to see trends emerging. Because if I'm asking one set of questions to one customer and you're asking a completely different set of questions to another customer about what happened, then how are we gonna see trends across the business? How are we gonna know if we do have a pricing issue? How are we gonna know if there is a competitor who's really you know, found our, our soft underbelly? How are we gonna know if there's a component of our product or our service that's head and shoulders above everyone else? We did an exercise for a company where we went out and asked a whole lot of their customers to rate 10 different buying criteria in order of priority. So they were existing customers. And they did that. And it was like, you know, price and, you know, this and that. And then we said, okay, now you've been a customer for a while. So could you please rate those same 10 criteria now that you're a customer as distinct from when you were making your buying decision? And something really, really interesting happened. 
account management and kind of after sales support that were nine and 10 on the list in terms of how they made their buying decision suddenly jumped up to one and two because they were saying once we'd signed on the line, now all of a sudden account management was incredibly important to us and support was incredibly important to us as well. So this particular vendor, they were a telco company, had very good account management and very good after sales support, but they'd never thought of it as a point of differentiation. So now what they were able to do was they were actually able to move the goalposts in new sales cycles that were working on and say to customers, look, we know you're talking to a couple of different vendors. When you do your reference checks, one of the questions you should ask is, what is this vendor like from an account management perspective and what's their after sales support like? Because we think we do a pretty good job of that. And in fact, we think we're probably the best in the industry. And as soon as you sign on the dotted line with whoever, that's going to become really important to you. And it changed the conversation completely. And they started winning deals that they were never winning before because customers realized, actually, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But until they'd done that just little piece of analysis, they didn't realize that a, we're very, very good at this, and B, this is a huge point of differentiation for us. And that's the meat of this. Once you start to find this stuff out, all of a sudden you can spin the cube and you can start to look at things from a different perspective and things that might have appeared to be a problem actually can become an opportunity. So that's, it frustrates me we're putting all of this time and effort and energy and blood, sweat and tears into these sales cycles. And I know I carried a quota for 15 years. I know how much stress and effort and internal scrutiny is put on salespeople. We can't be allowing these deals to not only be lost, but for us to extract no value from it and then go ahead and make the same mistake again. Or maybe even worse, you win a deal, you don't know why you won it. So how do you make that repeatable the next time and the next time? It's crazy. It's 21st century. We've got to be getting better at this stuff. Customers have the data, they have the insights, and they're actually really willing to share. All we need to do is actually get the context of how do we extract that and then have the appetite to, you know, to take our medicine and, and hear some stuff that might not be pleasant. So in an organization, who is responsible for doing that analysis on the win-loss? Is that- Great question. Is it talking to the sales rep and then turning around and talking to the sales engineer? Is it sales operation, sales enablement? Is it the sales leader? Outside of hiring Trinity, yep. perspectives, right? What does a, a larger organization do to be able to implement a true win win loss analysis. Well, okay, so you made a good point there. So I think if if you are a larger organization, be it Trinity or someone else, you should probably get an independent third party because if you're a larger organization, there's a good chance that your what you're selling, you know, there's a reasonable high value on that. So for a very small increment to your cost of sale, you actually get really good data and you get a third party to do it. But if you're a small or medium sized business, you can absolutely do this internally yourself. So there's a couple of factors. You want somebody who is removed from the sales cycle. So somebody who wasn't involved in the sales cycle at all because that creates enough separation. But you also need somebody, you know, imagine for a moment, I give you some very unpleasant feedback, right? I tell you some stuff about a couple of your, your team on the deal who were arrogant and they were unresponsive and they yeah. did really, really poor presentations and they didn't listen and whatever. So that's not easy feedback to receive. So you have to think about the individual inside your organization who's getting that feedback, do they have, you know, are they senior enough? Do they have an understanding of the political dynamics enough? Are they well enough liked that people aren't going to say, well, hang on, you're just pointing the finger of blame at me. You have to be able to get past all of that sort of stuff and say, look, we want to get better as an organization. This is a mechanism for us to invest in you as salespeople. I used to um, book sales enablement and sales development training for my team. And it was like, got a bit of a budget left over, end of the quarter, what are we going to do? Someone come along and said, hey, what about negotiation training? Sure, yeah, what's that cost, right? We, you know, throw 20 grand at that. Crazy. Like, I didn't know if negotiation training was the thing we should be doing. No one else knew, but we, we had some, some sales and admin budget. So, hey, let's spend it because you're going to lose it. That's yeah. crazy. That's crazy because it, maybe the thing was presentation skills. Maybe it was listening skills. Maybe it was discovery and needs analysis. Maybe it was deal crafting. We just didn't know. So now what that's doing is all the noise is going away. It's like, guys, look, you've got lots of different challenges. Here's the two you should pick for this quarter because there's a burning platform there. You're losing deals hand over fist. And you made a really interesting comment, Mary, and I, I want to pick up on that. So in my world and probably most of your listeners, the way this analysis is done at the moment is a couple of people who are involved in the deal. We sit around in a room, we get out a crystal ball, we start rubbing the top of it and saying, what do you think happened? Particularly in a losing situation, what do you think happened? Well, I think they were always leaning towards the incumbent. I think they were all, yeah, okay, tick. We're, that's one. Uh, price, so we, do we think price? Yeah, price, okay, that's two. We need one more, three is a magic number, so we come up with the third one, and then what? We like stick it in a CRM, that becomes the default narrative for what happened on that deal, and we move on to the next one, right? Now, we can all have a bit of a smile and a chuckle at that, except for 
all of the time and effort and money and cost of sale and opportunity cost that went into that deal. And maybe we've had another competitive loss, so they've got another you know, story to tell against us. And we haven't even done basic analysis to say, how are we going to get better the next time? And then we lose another one. And then we say, oh, why is this happening? And we go back and we check CRM. We did a piece of work with a client and they said, look, we're losing actually a lot of deals and we're losing them for two reasons. I said, just before we dive into the detail, can you just um, help me understand how do you know you're losing them for those two reasons? And they were saying, oh, well, they're the things in CRM that, you know, tell us that. I was like, okay. Just before we go too far in, could you create a dummy, a dummy entry for me in CRM system and then close it out and tell me, are there any steps after you close out loss, do nothing? Is there any other triggers or do any bells go off or does anything happen? And after you close out loss for some other reason, no. Okay, now do it for loss, competitive loss. Now do it for, and all these bells and whistles go off. So what was happening was the reps were taking the path of least resistance, picking one or two, you know, one of these two reasons to close out a deal in their CRM system, which required no additional scrutiny, no bells, no people coming down on them like a ton of bricks. So the data was completely flawed, and yet they were about to make, you know, strategic decisions about the future direction of their business aren't based on this flawed data. So this is what we're trying to address. You know, you've done the work, you've earned the right to this feedback. Don't leave those nuggets of gold sitting on the table. It's just a missed opportunity. So interestingly enough, um, we have in our contract implementation process, we do what's called a contract implementation form. The salesperson who sells it needs to put it through the implementation form. It captures all the information, you know, when we're going to bill, you know, on the, who's the accounting person's going to be, date of the contract, terms. So we're tracking this in our, in our database, right? And recently I said, you know, <laughs> we are not tracking wins and losses. Like we need to understand why we're winning and why we're losing. So we put inside there, you know, why and or how did we win this deal? And literally inside the, the form, it says this answer will be cut and pasted into our company win announcement report. And so th this is the one I love referral from customer so-and-so. That's why we won. Right. Wow. <laughs> now the person who did that is going to listen to this podcast on my team and they're going to be like, <laughs> Wait, who is it I'm talking about, <laughs> but I looked at this and I was like, you're kidding me, right? How can we as an organization replicate and duplicate a success if all we got was a referral? If all you said was it was a referral, like why did they buy? That's what I want to understand. Why are they engaged? Why did they trust you? Why did they believe in our process? And those are the types of things that you want to really start analyzing and drilling down into yeah. because that's where you're going to get duplicate and replicate. And that's what we know as the name of the game. is 100%. But I think, you know, what that individual in your team could have done was say, you know, we all know with the referral, usually what happens is the trust is passed from the referrer to the referee. So tell me who was the referrer? Tell me a little bit of detail about how did that actually happen? Because then you can actually start to replicate, okay, what can we do to drive more referrals? Because we know the hit rate is higher. We know the need to discount is lower. We know all these things. So if all leads are created equal, then referrals are at the top of the food chain. So what right. are we doing as a business to actually, you know, proactively create a mechanism for referrals? So yeah, great point. Yeah, interesting. Now you um, wrote the book, The Rebirth of the Salesman. W when was that published, by the way? 2016, November 2016. About a year and a half ago, and which obviously, I mean, not obviously, it was an Amazon number one bestseller. First off, help me understand, why did you pick that title? Is there some sort of evolution that you think salespeople need to evolve to based upon the current sales climate? There is, and this is, I don't consider this product placement, but just let me hold up the cover for a moment and you see the kind of the evolution occurring here. Oh, um, just, just like the re like real evolution. Yeah, 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 exactly right. That was the kind of the intent behind it. So look, why did I pick that title? Death of the Salesman is, is a play that is, you know, incredibly well known around the world. And it's one that kind of has a position in, in the, the landscape of, of literature, but also of the understanding of what salespeople are about. Where, I, where I'm approaching things from is I'm talking to lots and lots of customers and I'm seeing firsthand what it is that constitutes value for them, what it is that constitutes relevance for them in the eyes of the salespeople they work with. And so what I'm seeing is a huge amount of change and evolution in terms of you know, the landscape. And I think we're all familiar with the fact that the balance of power has shifted. You know, customers have the power now, we don't. So in that environment, what I wanted to do was almost write, write a book which salespeople could pick up and say, right, what do I need to do to stay relevant for the next five or 10 years? What do I need to do to, um, you know, still have a career to, you know, avoid the rise of artificial intelligence to disrupt my own skills before someone else or, or a piece of technology comes in and disrupts that. And I wanted to do that 
by leaning on the voice of the customer. Because for me to tell them this stuff, how could I tell them confidently that this was, you know, something that they should invest in in terms of their time and their energy? But if I could le- tap into customers, customers say, you know what, I don't care about that. I don't care about that. I really, really, really care about that. I don't want a generalist. I want a specialist. I don't want someone who's going to come and sell me something because, it, you know, if you think about this, Mario, and I'm interested in your, your feedback on this, I have a really simple philosophy that a customer is only a customer when they buy from you for the second time. Usually when they buy the first time, they're dipping their toe in the water, they're giving us an opportunity. And depending on how we perform in that first engagement, then all of a sudden things open up and we have great opportunity or things close down because you know what? We didn't earn the right to move forward. That's some of the stuff that I I really, really want salespeople to understand. Don't try and extract every dollar of value from your first interaction because you know what? You know, a customer for life is a much, much better customer to have than one for five minutes. First off, I, I cannot disagree with the philosophy. I suppose, though, it depends. And it depends on, for example, in a service-based training industry like our, like ourselves, I'll take the pilots all day long because the pilots will net out to a much bigger opportunity, right? So instead of training 5,000 salespeople, sure, you want to put a pilot of 50 people into a pilot? No problem, because that's going to turn into the 5,000. But that's my point. So that's my point. They, you take the 50, so that's the, that's the first piece. So that's the customer for the first time. And then you do a bang up job on the 50 and you earn the right to have the conversation around the 5,000. But I think too often we're just focusing on just let me close or I can close, let me close or I can close. And actually that's a missed opportunity to recognize that once you're inside the tent, all sorts of amazing things can happen. But we're, we're trying to stick a knife through the tent and get in that way rather than you know, letting, having them invite us in. Yeah. I think it also depends though, I would say, because if you're selling a software technology, so like from a training perspective, it makes sense because you can scale that down. Uh, If you're selling a software technology solution, most oftentimes you're selling a license, right? So, but I think what you're saying is, is maybe don't be afraid to sell the pilot uh, for a 90 day period and allow yourself to prove yourself so that you can move into the next phase of the pilot, which is an actual purchase well, don't get me wrong. I'm also saying if the opportunity is there to go company wide straight away, don't don't say. Well, I heard it. this. I heard this guy on a podcast. So I'll just stick with the pilot. But all I'm saying is, you know, sometimes we're too focused on just close something, just close something. We don't recognize that the first thing we close is often just you know the first breadcrumb on the on the trail ahead of us. So yeah. Gotcha. You know, one of the things that I think you and I agree on is that the world of sales is changing has changed and the climate has changed and such that I've said this before and I've heard a lot of people say the opposite, which is I believe that the B2B sales environment has become so much more complex for sellers for many different reasons. One of them is because of the way buyers are buying, but other reasons is because while the world around us has become much more automated salespeople are still have the same level of pressures and the same level of details that we still have to accomplish. Like nobody's taken away contracts off my desk. Nobody's taken away implementation forms off my desk. Nobody's taken away the proposal development, the engineering process, the strategy piece, the entering of the CRM, you name it, go down the list, right? Nobody's taken that away from me. So I think this climate has gotten much more harder for salespeople which is probably one of the reasons why we're are the one of the most well paid uh, uh, professionals, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because of that, but it is definitely a high pressure environment. And I know that you struggled with the stress and pressure of sales and sales leadership, as I have. And for God's sakes, my wife is like, as now that I'm scaling up Vingresso, she's like, you know, when you were a VP of sales, you used to make a little bit more money (laughs) and you worked less hours. Are you sure? But the stress is there. Talk about some of the strategies that you learned to manage this, this stress so that it can impact in a positive way your sales effectiveness. Look, I think the first thing I'll do is I'll acknowledge exactly what you did, which was that I did, I did struggle. For me, I think, and like a lot of people, you have all these different stresses and pressures. And so you do the only thing you can. You bury them deep and hope that nothing happens and nothing explodes. And for me, unfortunately, it did. And that meant that I had heart issues in my early 30s. I was, you know, rocking up into the emergency room on a regular basis with stress-related heart issues. And one of the occasions where it happened, they said, look, you've had this issue for a week now. You're at a high uh, risk of heart attack or stroke. So we're going to have to stop your heart and restart your heart. And I was 35 or something. So I said to myself that day, all right, this something's got to change. This is not, this is not sustainable. And so thankfully I got through that. And 
So I started to kind of look at this. And one of the things that was interesting when I built my business, it was only maybe a couple of years in that I had a bit of an epiphany. And I was like, why did I build a business to do this thing? And I realized that much of the stress and pressure that I felt as a, as a salesperson or a sales leader was all of the unknowns, all of the things which I couldn't control in the sales cycle. And a lot of that sits on the customer side of the fence. And then I think I realized that, well, maybe if we go through this process of actually talking to the customer and engaging with them in a different way, we can find this stuff out and some of those unknowns will become knowns. And then we can learn from it. So that was actually a real epiphany. I was like, wow, I've accidentally built a business to address the stresses I was feeling as a salesperson when I was under stress. That was a real surprise to me. And so now I see that as a mechanism for us to help other salespeople and sales leaders say, we'll find this stuff out for you guys. Whether you like what we find out or not is, is almost immaterial. We'll find it out. You don't have to stress about that. Why did I lose that deal? We all knew we were going to win that deal and we lost it at the 11th hour. What happened? Right, we'll go in and find out. So that was what, park that, that was one mechanism. But for me, the other thing was, you've got to find a mechanism to get the stress out. So, you know, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's yoga, whether it's meditation, whether it's going out for a walk, whether it's swimming, something that, you know, is a regular repeatable uh, outlet. To, outlet, exactly right, uh, for you to do that. You've also got to understand what some of the triggers are for stress and find ways to, to mitigate that. Because to your point, as more and more technology comes in, our requirements for salespeople to do other admin reporting, you know, CRM entry, all this other stuff, it has gone up and up and up. And there, there seems to be a lack of understanding that, that all we're doing is just adding more activity and pressure and, and you know, noise to their lives. Oh, and by the way, your quota has gone up as well. Oh, by the way, your territory has been reduced. Oh, by the way, you know, there's more competitors coming in. And oh, by the way, the market's getting tighter. Now go out and sell. It's like, you know, we're just squeezing it, squeezing it, squeezing it, and then adding more in and squeezing that again. And I just don't think it's sustainable. So I think at an individual level, you have to learn some stuff. I wrote an article about this. Some of it is also about the ability to be able to push back and say, no, that quota is not realistic based on the territory. So something needs to change. The quota needs to come down. The territory needs to expand. You need to give me access to more products or services or whatever. And actually being confident enough in, in your own abilities and also doing enough due diligence around what is appropriate to say, you go and 10% growth year on year with no context, with no planning, with no view of the market conditions is not realistic. And being able to back yourself and back your skills to the extent of saying, if not here, then I can I can find another role. So, so really good salespeople are hard to find. Really, really great salespeople are incredibly hard to find. So actually, if you cast your mind back 150 years ago where the salesperson had their briefcase and was going door to door, you know, our briefcase is, is our LinkedIn profile and, and what we have up here and our network and all of those things. Nowadays, we won't be picking a big box up and walking out. There's nothing to put in that box anymore. Maybe your phone. You don't even get to keep your phone. So it's your network and your experience and your knowledge. And, you know, I've had, I've had close friends have heart attacks in the office and pass away in hotel rooms and things like that. Ian, pressure goes somewhere. It has to go somewhere. And so as an industry, we need to pay more attention to this and we need to look after these people more but as individuals we need to step up and start owning it and not just assume that we can kind of continue on as you know as machines and, and nothing will ever give because it will give yeah well i mean and a great example of that is this is my me personally uh we're in our third year of entrepreneurship and it's like you know it's like boiler room it's like the pressure cooker is on and of course every year we get older not that I'm old, right? I'm 41 years old. So the fact of the matter is though, it only is sustainable for a short period of time when you allow yourself to be under a certain amount of pressure. Correct. And then you start to feel the effects of it. And as salespeople, I mean, look, here's what I say. <laughs> this is why when people say to me, I just don't understand. He, he or she got paid X hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And what did they do? And, they, and they're this and they're that. Well, let me, yeah. let me just say this. But what is it? Less than 5% of the world's population is in sales. Is that the number? I, th I think it's, it's a very small number. What do we do as salespeople? Guess what? We put our entire family's health benefits on carrying a quota. We put our car payment on carrying a quota. We put our mortgage on carrying a quota. And guess what? If we don't do it, everybody else who doesn't carry a bag doesn't get paid. Because to what you said earlier, nothing happens until a sale is made. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I talk to teams all the time who are maybe, you know, consultants or engineers or whatever. And, and that's a conversation I'm very, very happy to have. I'm like, guys, you know, you, you, tell me your view of sales. Not, not, not just salespeople, but sales. And we get all that out on the table. 
and then I call bullshit on a lot of it. I say, guys, do you enjoy paying your, your mortgage? Do you enjoy putting your kids through school? Do you enjoy occasionally going away on a holiday? You do recognize that none of that happens. And also, do you enjoy having a bit of career longevity and consistency? Because most salespeople, two bad quarters and they're, you know, either they're out or they're, you know, they're between the crosshairs. Yes, there is a potential to get reward, but there's a potential to, you know, to get a, a coronary. There's a potential to lose your marriage. There's a potential to have all these other things. So there's a lot of risk and a lot of reward being balanced there. And I have a huge respect for salespeople and, you know, for the younger people coming up, but also for the people who've been in the trenches for 20 or 30 years doing this. You know, one of the things that frustrates me, and going back to a question you asked early on about, you know, what are customers saying about the decisions they, they make? A lot of what we hear when we hear about losses is they were just unprofessional. They were unprofessional or, you know what, they just didn't listen to us. They just kind of show up and throw up or we felt they were high risk. So all three of those things come up very frequently in, in loss reviews. And that's a huge frustration for me because I think we need to elevate, you know, we talk about being sales professionals, but putting the profession in sales professional because you hear about the medical profession, the legal profession, but you don't really hear about the sales profession. You just hear about people who kind of become salespeople. I think there's an onus an opportunity, but also an onus of responsibility and us to elevate the profession and say, no, we're actually doing something which takes a lot of intelligence and intent and, and work ethic and, and it deserves a lot more respect. And um, there's a very small minority who over the years have kind of maybe given the industry a bad name. But the great thing about what's happened is as the advent of the internet and, and access to information becomes freely available, those people get found out. They get found out really, really quickly and they either change their ways or they go out of business. And so I just feel that the industry is getting better. You know, the people coming out at the bottom are, are being given you know, some good training and some good coaching and, and just getting the basics down. And I think the next five or 10 years could be really exciting for the changing perception of salespeople. I, at least that's my hope. And, you know, people like yourself, Mario, and a lot of the people that we know, we're all chipping away at the edges to try and do something to influence that in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a, a fabulous conversation, Ken. Do me a favor. Can you tell us... If someone wants to get a hold of you, what is the best way to connect? Are you on Twitter? Are you on LinkedIn, Instagram? You, you tell us. Not Instagram. I think I'm, I haven't got anything visual enough to put on Instagram. Certainly on, on LinkedIn, uh, you, can, you can hit me up, uh, Kean McLaughlin. You can head to our website, trinityperspectives.com.au. Just give you a quick 30 Do me a seconds. favor, spell your last name so that everybody's got that. Yeah, sure. So, so Kean is the first name, C-I-A-N, McLaughlin, M-C-L-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Um, I was just going to say on the name of the business, Trinity Perspectives. Trinity has a bit of an Irish connection. I'm from Ireland, but it was really one perspective is the customer. One perspective is the vendor. Oh, and then we bring a third perspective. So that's where the, the Trinity Perspectives comes from. So that's kind of the background. Ah, mm. I like it almost like Vingresso and uh, that uh, the mashup of two uh, Spanish words, which is ventas for sale and ingresos for revenue. Oh, and nice. the two combined makes Vingresso. <laughs> I like it. Excellent. There's usually some sort of meaning, which is fabulous. Is. Uh, and I always like to ask this question, and I think I actually forgot to ask you in the beginning. Tell me something before I'll ask you two questions. Tell us something nobody would know about you by looking at your social profiles. I used to write comedy for TV. Did you really? Mm. Ah, okay. Well, I'm waiting for some comedic value then to be have to have added to the next blog or yeah. the next video or something. We'll have to do that, man. We'll have to elevate the the comedy level. Yeah. All okay, right, fantastic. And uh, your all-time favorite movie, what is it? Shawshank. Shawshank Redemption. Yep, Shawshank Redemption. And you know what's really interesting? My first six months out of corporate, I felt like a character from Shawshank because I realized I was totally institutionalized having worked in corporate for 15 or 20 years. I couldn't make a basic decision. So it was really interesting to sort of, you know, find that correlation to the movie and then have to learn how to live in the outside world again. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast 
to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes, along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. 